damn late. I had to stop by the wax museum again and give the finger to FDR. We know Al-Qaeda, Zawahiri, is supporting the opposition in Syria. Are we supporting Al-Qaeda in Syria? Well, it's a proud day for America. And by God, we've kicked Vietnam syndrome once and for all. Thank you very, very much. I say it, I say it again. You've been had. You've been took. You've been hoodwinked. These witnesses are trying to simply deny things that just about everybody else accepts as fact. He came, he saw, he died. But we ain't killing their army, but we killing them. We be on CNN like say our name, Ben, say it, say it three times. The meeting of the largest armies in the history of the world. Then there's going to be an invasion. All right, you guys, introducing the great Patrick Coburn, Middle East correspondent for The Independent, independent independent.co.uk, and he's the author of the books Chaos and Caliphate and The Age of Jihad, as well as Muqtada and other important books before that. Welcome back to the show. How are you doing, Patrick? I'm doing good, thank you. Great. Uh, Good to talk to you again. Uh, Very happy to have you here on the show. And... um, so, I don't know if you noticed this or not, but yesterday, Senator Rand Paul mentioned your work on the House floor in a speech. Did you see that? I didn't see that, actually. No, that's hmm. very interesting. Uh, yeah, it was, um, the context was in uh, quoting the WikiLeaks of uh, Hillary Clinton talking about Gulf support for the Islamic State, even after they were the Islamic State. And um, That's right. Yeah, it's one of the most... Many striking things of what uh, WikiLeaks uh, released. That uh, there was this, you know, very uh, State Department memo that uh, she had uh, saying that you know the main support for uh, uh, Islamic State was Saudi Arabia and the Gulf states. Mm-hmm. Uh, something that um, Washington certainly wasn't saying in public, you know, and is vitally important because uh, you know that's uh, that's what really got. Uh, ISIS off the ground. Yeah. Well, you know what? I want to talk all about Iraq War Three and all these different things, but let's go ahead and talk about WikiLeaks a bit here for a minute. There's so much important stuff going on, and you recently wrote a piece sticking up for Julian Assange and uh, for WikiLeaks. Um, you want to talk about that for a minute? Absolutely. Yeah, I think everybody should be talking about this. I think that this is, you know, one of the most important sort of threats to free expression that I've known in my career. Um, you know, Assange uh, released all these government documents. Um, many of them showed, you know, what the real government, U.S. government uh, policy was, uh, what they saw the real policy of uh, uh, was of, uh, of foreign governments. Uh, you know, there are many others... Uh, one could point to that uh, there's one from the uh, U.S. Embassy in, in Yemen saying, uh, commenting, this is quite some time ago, but things haven't changed, on the idea that the Houthis were a proxy of Iran and supported by Iran, saying, really, there isn't much evidence for this, and uh, there isn't any evidence for this, and mm-hmm. uh, these guys are getting their weapons not from Iran, they're, they're buying them on the black market, or they're getting them from the government army, which sells them and then pretends that uh, uh, it's lost them in battle. Uh, so it's full of revelations, and I think the way that uh, you know one can judge how important these are is the sort of persecution and endless pursuit of Assange, uh, the way he's now in jail for publicizing these articles, you know, which appeared in these documents appeared in the New York Times, The Guardian, you know, many other places. But uh, generally, they, you know, they've been pretty shy of that defending it since it was put in jail. Hey guys, Scott here for Liberty Under Attack Publications. Looking for a liberty-focused publisher? Liberty Under Attack publishes books and strategy guides for individuals looking to increase their personal freedom. They assist authors through the entire publishing process, proofreading, editing, cover designs, paperback and Kindle formatting, and full audiobook narration and post-production. Tell them Scott sent you and get 20% off a full-service deal. To get some one-of-a-kind books or for more information, visit libertyunderattack.com. Now, do you think that there's any chance that 
public pressure in the UK could prevent him from being extradited to the US? I think it does have an effect because, you know, initially I think there was a rather disgusting, to my mind, attacks on uh, Assange by other journalists that uh, somehow he wasn't a proper journalist. Well, you know, he, he produced these amazing revelations. That's what journalists are meant to do. You know, then there were, you know, that he wasn't, but he was a narcissist. You know, there'll be a lot of those around. Is that a great crime? You know, even if true. Uh, and it's, it's scarcely balanced what to be done and uh, what's happened to him since. Uh, more recently, that does seem to be, you know, gradually, quite a lot of journalists seem to should be realizing that what's happening to Assange could happen to them. You know, it's the same, you know, one sees this pursuit in country after country. We've seen it in Turkey, you know, we've seen it in Egypt, you know, this growing persecution of journalists and suppression of uh, free speech. Uh, and if Assange is extradited to the U.S. and put in jail there, it would be a tremendous blow to free expression. Hmm. And there's a real qualitative difference there. I mean, already the persecution of whistleblowers inside the government is completely out of control, but the conflation of the recipient of a leak who then publishes that with the person who actually did the leak, as in the Assange espionage indictment, is a huge step. Uh, this is what I call the technification of law. You know, this is what uh, happens in Turkey. But, uh, if you publish anything which it's got to the stage, anything published which is critical of the government, well, who is critical of the government? Well, terrorists are critical of the government. So you criticize the government, you're a terrorist, you know, mm-hmm. which has led to over 70 journalists being put in jail, you know, the total suppression of uh, the free press in Turkey. Yeah, I'll have to remember that one, the Turkification of American law. Uh, yeah, and and back to what you were saying, too, about the quality of these leaks. It's, you know, it's not just, hey, the New York Times got some stories out of it, but there must have been 10,000 stories that have at least some reference to the WikiLeaks if they're not entirely based on those State Department cables and those Iraq and Afghan war logs. I mean, those are everything. In this last decade... Yeah, if you want to know about these wars, these are the things you have to read. You know, if you want to read know about American foreign policy, you have to read them. You know, these are much closer to the truth than what you can read in the uh, in the mass media elsewhere, because this is what the government really says. It's also complete nonsense, you know, to say that this is a breach of security, lives are put in danger. I remember, uh, you know, this first broke, I was in Afghanistan, and so happened I was seeing it an American uh, official, and he was sort of saying, what's the coding on these documents? And I, well, there was some of the information, and he said, oh, well, of course, that, no, that's not a good, uh, you know, a real security uh, uh, threat. Because you, these were, you know, what uh, uh, Chelsea Manning uh, uh, leaked, these were widely distributed, and uh, um, the reason being that... Uh, different parts of the U.S. government hadn't uh, known what the, the others were doing during the Iraq War, so they thought it better people could plug into a, a general uh, bank of information. But they also, uh, you know, saw that they weren't going to put their DB secrets there with so many people who could access it. And he said it wasn't uh, the threat of foreign governments finding this out, which would have been quite easy, because the fact that the public could find this out, that's what really frightened them and still does. Yeah, isn't that telling, too? All right, well, so, and including the Afghan war logs, of course, is a big part of it. So there's my segue to Afghanistan. Uh, Two big things going on there. First of all is uh, Zalmay Khalilzad, the neoconservative, has been appointed as the special representative to uh, negotiate an exit with the Taliban. They're also talking, uh, the Taliban are also talking with the Afghan government in talks in Moscow uh, separately there. Uh, and both of these things, I mean, the fact that Khalilzad is still carrying on with this thing and it's gone on for a while, it seems to indicate some real seriousness there. At the same time, the military seems to be unashamedly trying to belay that order. And they're saying that, no, ISIS-K, old Pakistani Taliban guys, I guess, and, and ex-Taliban fighters in Afghanistan, they represent an international terrorist menace that's going to attack the United States from Afghanistan and so we have to stay to prevent their establishing a permanent safe haven there. What do you think? 
Yeah, I mean, that's the U.S. military also, you know, and the same thing in Syria, uh, wanting to stay. Um, you know, usually they've got their way in the past. They seem to get their way in Syria. Um, you know, will the same thing happen in Afghanistan? I would have thought a good chance. Well, what do you think about uh, ISIS-K? Are they separate, worse than the Taliban? Sworn well, loyal to Baghdadi? You know, yes, you know, they have some significance, but, uh, you know, not that great. You know? Uh, you know, there's a, a contradictory message coming from the U.S. military, and uh, which is one, you know, we've de- defeated uh, ISIS, you know, the, the caliphate no longer exists, we won this great victory. Yet they want to keep it going as a sort of potential threat to justify uh, U.S. military presence in Syria and uh, Afghanistan and elsewhere. So at one moment, you know, these guys have been wiped out, and the next moment, you know, they're uh, they're coming over the hill. So, uh, you know, we're seeing this again in uh, Afghanistan. Hey guys, a quick programming note for you. If you signed up for the Just the Interviews feed at the Libertarian Institute, you're probably going to need to go over and sign up at scotthorton.org instead, or at least if you're on iTunes there. Uh, iTunes has canceled the Just the Interviews feed from the Institute, I guess just because it's redundant with the scotthorton.org feed. So either go over to scotthorton.org and sign up for Just the Interviews there, or stay at the Institute and sign up for the other podcast feed, and then that way you'll get my show plus the great Kyle Anzalone, Pete Raymond, and of course Patrick McFarlane and Keith Knight as well. That's all at scotthorton.org or libertarianinstitute.org. Well, and what about the talks? Do you think that um, it's possible that the Americans and the Taliban and I guess the Afghan government in Kabul could come to some kind of more or less ceasefire and hold the lines where they are and establish some sort of workable peace or it's going to be civil war until one side is done losing? It's difficult to see how, you know, that would work, you know, sort of Afghanistan is so broken up, you know, into different uh, areas, controlled by the government, controlled by the Taliban, controlled by nobody. It's difficult to see this happening. Uh, It does, uh, you know, show that, uh, you know, consciousness that nobody's winning this war, uh, uh, but it's it's difficult to see it uh, working in the long term. Yeah. Well, I mean, certainly the concept of defeating the Taliban militarily has been taken off the table permanently. All factions seem to agree on that when they talk about it. They say there must be a political settlement. But like you're saying, everything is so out of balance or or the power even non-existent in some areas and this kind of thing that it can't stand up. The, the status quo can't hold. And so... We can't leave without essentially our guys losing or at least suffering major consequences for, for losing our support. And, and so there's not really a way to do it that looks good. And so easier to stay, I guess. Yeah, you know, the whole Afghan thing, uh, 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 you know, everybody who gets involved in Afghanistan regrets it. I mean, outside powers, the British came to regret it. Uh, partly because there isn't a central government to uh, to overthrow. Uh, uh, so, you know, power is distributed, fragmented throughout the country. Um, you know, it's an incredibly long time since, I remember, you know, 2001, being uh, stuck in a village uh, just south of the Pancho Valley, just north of Kabul. And a few months later, uh, Washington and everybody else was announcing the final defeat of the Taliban. I mean, I followed them south to Kandahar, and it was very evident at that time that uh, they were going home. They hadn't really been defeated. Um, and, you know, that the assumption, what happened then, you know, has produced this, uh, you know, 18 years of war, solid war. Is it now going to end? Well, wars have gone on that long. You know, they, they build up their own momentum. They build up a a war economy, people got an interest in the war going on, so it's difficult to see it stopping soon. Yeah. Well, one thing is, um, I was talking with Matthew Ho, the former uh, Marine and State Department whistleblower. Um, Oh, sure, yeah. mm -hmm. And he was saying, you know, one thing about the current situation, if you compare it to the 1990s, is that in the 90s, the Taliban had the support of America 
at least the tacit support of America, I don't know about direct support, but certainly the approval of the Clinton administration for the Saudis and the Pakistanis to back their takeover of the whole country, the capital city and the rest too. And they said so in testimony and all that's in the book. Um, and um, But uh, so they don't have that this time. Right, so the it would take to Matt. He said he thought that without the Pakistanis there to back them to the hilt in an attempt to take the capital city and the rest of the country over, that they might refrain from doing that. They might realize they don't really have the support for that. That, in other words, possibly something like the current lines could hold because they've bitten off about as much as they can chew, and they and they know that they can't take over the rest really. Yeah, though, it's kind of realistic, but it doesn't mean the fighting will stop, you know. Right. Um, you know, that's been fairly clear for some time, but uh, the fighting still goes on. You know, it was, it was evident also, you know, that, that so long as they were defended by Pakistan, you know, this normal, normal sort of semi-open border, that the Taliban were going to stay in business. And so long as you had weak, corrupt governments in Kabul, which is what they've always had. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think that that's realistic. That there is a sort of stalemate, but unfortunately, it's not a peaceful stalemate. It's a sort of military stalemate in which the fighting still goes on. Okay. Well, in terms of American public relations and an excuse to leave a setup in order to to disentangle at least the U.S. from the conflict, not that that not that that would resolve it, but. Um, what about the idea of trying to mimic something like the awakening uh, situation in Western Iraq in 2007 and eight, where you say, okay, Taliban, you get rid of the Islamic State, and we'll recognize the fact that we'll call them the foreign fighters. They are kind of Pakistani at their core, Tariqi Taliban guys. We'll call them foreign fighters and say, as long as you get rid of them for us, then you can make up with us, and then we can find the door. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think actually the Iranians were trying to do that with some success um, in uh, to get rid of the um, Islamic State in that area. Um, uh, could they do that? I suppose they might. Mm-hmm. You're um, saying in that area near work. near the it Iranian border? A long time in Iraq as well. Mm-hmm. You're saying near the Iranian border they were working with the Taliban against the Islamic State there? The Iranians were, yeah, uh-huh. the... Um, uh, we're working with the Taliban at one moment. I mean, the but Russians... You know, bear in mind that the awakening movement in uh, Western Iraq ended up by, you know, being unsuccessful. Right. The, uh, it worked for a time, you know, you can... Uh, uh, but uh, yeah, it's very difficult to eliminate uh, ISIS. Uh, um, and, uh, you know, would the Taliban really do it? You know, it's still, it's still somewhat up in the air. Yeah. Although it really did, as you reported at the time, in real time, step by step, it really took America and allied support for the Sunni-based insurgency in Syria to blow up into the Islamic State in Iraq. The status quo was pretty bad before that, but the jihadists didn't really come to prominence until America really made it that way with Chapter 2 of that thing. So, I don't know. Yeah. Still just an analogy anyway, but yeah. Um, and yeah, it's one of those uh, many miscalculations made. Yeah, well, and they're still making it. You know, I was uh, I interviewed Peter Ford earlier, a former UK ambassador sure. to Syria, and he was saying that our Gulf allies are still backing the essentially the Al Nusra Front (HTS) they call themselves now in the Idlib province in Syria. Yeah, I mean, you know, that's that's the case. You know, Turkey is essentially uh, backing them. Um, the, uh, you know, it's one of the strange things that happened in the last few months is you <clears throat> have lots of publicity on ISIS, uh, losing its last stronghold on the, uh, uh, in, um, eastern Syria, at the end of the caliphate, and nobody paying much attention to the fact that, you know, there is an al-Qaeda linked organization, you know, with, uh, uh, its own sort of principality in in northwestern Syria. I mean, the difference is, of course, that uh, um, these guys are, are in opposition to the uh, the terrible Assad and uh, the horrible Russians. So, because they sort of get a pass on this. Mm-hmm. 
um, yeah, the, the Sunni based insurgency are the bad guys on the east side of the line, and they're still the heroes on the west side of the line, moderate rebels, I guess. And now, you know, Peter Ford said that, I, I'm not exactly sure the source for this, but he was saying his number was uh, seventy to 80,000 of these guys essentially under the umbrella of the Al Nusra Front there in Idlib province. Does that sound right to you? Yeah, that's that's the figure that's around. Um, hardcore fighters, maybe a bit less, but you know, it's it's a very high number, you know, uh, and it's you know, a population of three million. Uh, um, the and you know, a lot of these are uh, uh, fighters uh, who uh, have uh, transferred from other parts of Syria. So, you know, this is the, this is the last stronghold. Mm-hmm. Um, the, uh, yeah, but that's, uh, that's broadly correct. And so that whole situation is rock and hard place and this and that. So you have the Syrian army and the Russians have, have started the airstrikes and the Syrian army is attacking at the southern part of Idlib province. In fact, Ford was saying they'd gone a little bit further than uh, he was expecting them to go so far. And the Americans are complaining and saying, stop bombing our friends in Al-Qaeda there. Uh, we can't stand that. Um, but then, you know, as you're talking about, the Turks right there on the northern border, they're still supporting these guys to some degree, protecting them. Um, but so, is there any kind of resolution to this that you could describe what you think it might look no, like is going to happen you know, here? What happened was that the, you had two groups in there. You had uh, the... Um, HDS, which was formerly Al Nusra, keep changing their name, uh, but essentially are the Al Qaeda linked groups. And you had another group that was really controlled by Turkey. But earlier this uh, year, the Al Qaeda linked group wiped out the or uh, uh, eliminated the um, Turkish linked uh, group earlier this year. So uh, it's the Al Qaeda linked group which is dominant in that area. And now it's been negotiating with the Turks and um, is uh, got closer to them. Um, the, it's coming under pressure from the, the Syrian army and the Russians. Um, but it's all, you know, it's, it's such a cat's cradle there that uh, the Russians want to push um, forward, but they don't want to do so at the price of losing their lives with Turkey. Hang on just one second. So you're constantly buying things from Amazon.com. Well, that makes sense. They bring it right to your house. So what you do, though, is click through from the link in the right-hand margin at scotthorton.org, and I'll get a little bit of a kickback from Amazon's end of the sale. Won't cost you a thing. Nice little way to help support the show. Again, that's uh, right there in the margin at scotthorton.org. Yeah. So what do you think Erdogan thinks his plan is? Well, no, it doesn't seem, I guess it really seem to have a plan at the moment. The Turkish policy has been pretty, pretty terrible since 2011. You know, when this first started happening in Syria and elsewhere, you know, if the Turks had, uh, had not backed, essentially backed the jihadis, backed the sectarian uprising, if they had, you know, at that time, Turkey was much more of a democracy and so forth. They had a lot to offer these areas, but... It backed sectarian Sunni groups um, in an area where much of the population is uh, is uh, Shia or Kurds. Uh, you know, this was uh, Turkey could have done a lot of things there, but its whole population, its policy has been uh, pretty disastrous, and more and more sort of sectarian uh, fueling up, basically fueling a religious war. Mm. All right, now so uh, let's talk about uh, Iraqi politics for a minute here. Um, it seems like they're, well, the first major question is uh, resolving the uh, political situation in the predominantly Sunni areas of Western Iraq um, and whether they can be successfully integrated into the government in a way where they're no longer essentially just left out to dry, as certainly they felt they were, uh, and in practice, I guess they really were, by the Nuri al-Maliki regime. But so now in the aftermath of Iraq War III and the destruction of the Islamic State, is the Baghdad government trying very hard to put the sectarian 
uh, you know, differences aside, regardless of their vast, uh, you know, superiority in terms of power in the government and trying, are they trying to be magnanimous and at all and, and figure out a way yeah, to reintegrate the West? Is something that uh, has um, been very present in Iraq for a long time. You know, they're kind of winners and losers at the moment. You know, from the, the, the main sort of striking force of the Sunni was ISIS. They've been essentially defeated, but they're still there. You know, there are packets of them out of the, out in the desert and mm-hmm. the sort of wastelands of western Iraq, Anbar province, which is about one third of Iraq. Uh, and, you know, they're picking off or kidnapping or killing, you know, Shia who uh, uh, come to the area, you know, um, lone travelers, uh, guys, um, uh, truffle hunters, a lot of truffle hunting in that area or truffles in that area, and uh, they pick up guys. If they're Sunni, they uh, um, charge them a certain amount of money. If they're Shia, they kill them. You know? So it's uh, you still have that going on. Uh, the Sunni in Mosul, their biggest city, you know, partly in ruins, they've been defeated. Uh, but the plus point in Iraq is, despite all this, there's less military action, less killing going on that has been for about 40 years. You know, I first went to Iraq in about 1977, and then uh, from about 79-80, Saddam took full control with the Iran-Iraq war. We had continual crises and emergencies, wars, sanctions, civil wars, more wars, for 40 years, and that has sort of ebbed for the moment, uh, maybe long term. Uh, it could be they kind of worry about what happens between the U.S. and Iran. Well, that, uh, you know, uh, pump things up again. Mm-hmm. But for the moment, things are a bit uh, a bit better. Uh, you don't have the same level of violence that you had in the past. Of course, Iraqis look around them, and because there's less violence, they know just what a wreck the place is. You know, there's lack of water, lack of electricity, lack of everything else. But, you know, for the moment, it is better. But going back to your point, will they, you know, will they reach a deal with the Sunni and so forth? I sort of doubt there'll be very much of that. I think we're really kind of the Shia have won for the moment. And that's the key political factor. Yeah. Well, which just spells chaos, right? Because it means that there essentially is no real state in Western Iraq, just like the situation was in 2012 and 13, where... Is sort of the well, there's an army, you know. I was in uh, Ramadi, you know, which had uh, been very badly, um, the center had been very badly sort of uh, smashed up. You know, a lot of that's been rebuilt uh, further along. There have been ISIS that massacred a lot of tribesmen, but uh, the, the Iraqi army was in pretty full control. I wouldn't say it was anarchy uh, there, I'd say that Baghdad had been fairly tight control of these areas. Yeah. Uh, along uh, along the river, but in, in the long term, it's difficult to, to maintain that because you know this is a vast area. People can hide out in the desert, and wait for a bit, and then uh, come back and fight. Mm. Well, and then there's the question too of the Gulf states again, and how much money they're willing to pour into Sunni insurgency there. Uh, that's the pattern all over the Middle East. That's the kind of tragedy of it. You know that you have, you know, from 2011, what did we have? We had an uprising. Uh, in many countries, you know, in uh, in Egypt, in Libya, in uh, Bahrain, Yemen, Syria. Uh, but, you know, the great contradiction uh, there was that you had an uprising of people who wanted liberty, democracy, and uh, better cut of um, economic benefits. And who was it backed by? It was backed by Gatter and Saudi Arabia and the Gulf monarchies, who were the last thing they wanted. These are the last absolute monarchies on earth. The last thing they want was democracy or freedom of expression or anything like that. Uh, so it was always sort of naive to imagine there was going to be a good outcome of this. Uh, you still have that throughout. You know, we've just seen this in Sudan in the last few days. The army suddenly moves against the protesters. By all accounts, they did so after they were given encouragement to do it by Mohammed bin Salman, by the crown prince in Saudi Arabia. Mm-hmm. Um, the uh, the predominance of these Gulf, uh, the Gulf oil states, their ability to sort of fund people within uh, in Sudan or Syria, uh, you know, means that um, where the, the, that these war 
struggles can go on, uh, that it's very difficult for a popular uprising to succeed. Uh, and when it looks like doing so, it tends to get sort of taken over by the most regressive elements. Mm-hmm. All right, so, and now you mentioned about American tensions with Iran, and one of the things, of course, uh, it's it's almost a joke at this point, is, of course, America's, uh, our national security state, I guess, uh, their resentment at Iran for inheriting all of eastern and southern Iraq as a result of Iraq War II. George W. Bush fought a whole war for Iran's, not just the Shia, but for the Supreme Islamic Council and the Dawah Party, Iran's best friends in all of Iraq, the expats who'd lived in Iran for 30 years, many of them. And so the Americans are always kind of trying to figure out a way to use their money and weapons as leverage to get the Iraqi government to lean more toward them and further from Iran. And of course, they they might be Iran's best friends, but they're not just sock puppets, right? I, they have their own interests, the Iraqis. Yeah, but, no, that's exactly right. You know, they, they, they do that. If you push, you know, an Iraqi prime minister too far, if the U.S. pushes an Iraqi prime minister too far, he looks like sort of getting too far into the American camp in a country, we know, which is the main fact about Iraq is, you know, that it's two-thirds Shia, the same as Iran. There are differences with Iran, but, you know, those are the two big Shia states in the world. They're not going to move that far from Iran. If you put too much pressure on uh, an Iraqi prime minister, as they did last year, if he uh, looks like moving too far from the Iranian position, then he's going to fall. Um, and, uh, you know, that's still the situation. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, the, the funny thing about this, uh, what Trump and uh, Pompeo and the others say about Iran sort of expanding its influence and so forth, I- Iranian influence tends to be high or is uh, capable of being expanded in areas where, you know, have a big Shia population uh, or Shia control. So that's in Iraq. Um, there's a rather different type of Shia, the Houthis in Yemen, uh, Lebanon with Hezbollah. Um, Syria is mostly Sunni, but the, the rulers are Alawites or a kind of Shia. They can't really operate much uh, beyond that. But when the U.S. acts against what it says is acting against the uh, U.S., uh, Iran, in these countries, it's sort of going to war with the, the Shia community in general. Um, and also, you know, it, it, the decision has already been reached in these places. It's obvious Assad's going to stay in Syria. It's obvious that the Shia won out in Iraq. Uh, you know, the, the Iranians are on the winning side of these places. Nothing much that the U.S. is going to do is going to change that. Right. Um, and although um, it seems like, well, not although, but because not just the Dawah Party and the Supreme Islamic Council, but even the Prime Ministers, Jafari, Maliki, and now Ahmadi, I mean, these guys are all essentially the compromise between America and Iran for who the Prime Minister of Iraq should be is sort of how this has played out all this time. And so I can see why the Americans kind of resent that, that the Iranians have benefited so much, but they should be fair enough and see the irony in it and be a good sport about the fact that it's all their fault in the first place. And since they support the same groups, um, you know, they could use their influence, I don't know, it, it seems like, Patrick, the, as far as I know, that the Iranians really have supported in Iraq War II, especially a much more sectarian agenda than, say, Muqtad al-Sadr, right, as you wrote about then. Um, it seems like there's room there for America to put pressure on um, the Iraqi government to be a little bit better about their victory against the Sunni here, um, maybe in a less sectarian war way than the Iranians prefer um, but that doesn't ever seem to be their agenda, really. That's that's do good or rinky dink stuff. Samantha Power said. Yeah, I think it's true. You know, it's it's I kind of you know when you look at it um, since 2011, it's all been a disaster. You know, you look at Syria, you look at Libya. You know, at one moment high hopes in uh, Egypt that uh, after the fall of Mubarak, but you know it's it's far more of an authoritarian state now than it was under Mubarak. Um, the, um, I think that, uh, you know, the U.S. is capable of sort of keeping things simmering in Syria, you know, that 
Assad hasn't quite won, although he will win, uh, on the idea of weakening uh, Assad. Well, that's kind of been the policy for six or seven years, you know. It's, but, you know, look at the disasters that have followed from that, you know, an enormous surge of uh, immigrants out of Syria or out of Turkey into Europe. Uh, ISIS was able to fill the vacuum there. Uh, you know, Trump comes in... Uh, <laughs> But, you know, the policy doesn't change that much, and it still has all the old weaknesses, and no lessons drawn from the disasters of the last, uh, you know, uh, how long is it now? You know, 20 years. years. Yeah. Yeah. Um, all right, so uh, one last thing, if you got a minute. Sure. Um, so you had reported back in 2015 about the internal Saudi politics behind the start of the Yemen war and how young 29-year-old, then 29-year-old Mohammed bin Salman was the new defense minister and deputy crown prince, and he essentially launched this war, Operation Decisive Storm, they called it, um, in order to boost his own credentials inside the government, and I guess it worked, right? He moved, he pushed his cousin out of the crown prince spot and took it for himself and uh, emerged as the power in Saudi. Um, but so I wonder now, do you know, are there any politics in Saudi that are trying to stop this guy from killing all the Yemenis at this point after more than four well, years well, of failure? Well, you know, he's sort of, he has pulled back him from the U.S., you know, he's got away, got away, got away with it so far. He wanted to expect a quick victory then. Saudi is a slightly lost interest in uh, Yemen after they failed to win a quick victory. Um, the um, most of uh, you know Mohammed um, bin Salman's uh, you know ventures abroad have been pretty disastrous. You know, sort of kidnapping the Lebanese prime minister for a bit that wasn't a great idea. The matter of uh, uh, Khashoggi in uh, Istanbul. Um, you know, now we'll see what there's a confrontation with Iran, the Saudis, between the U.S. and Iran. The Saudis are obviously pretty worried about that, but uh, what are they going to do about it? So, um, uh, in Yemen, um, yeah, they failed in 2015. He thought, you know, this is going to be a flashy victory. And, uh, won by, the, uh, by, the, by the, um, the new ruler. It just hasn't happened. But so there's really just no counter incentive at this point. The Trump administration certainly is backing them. I know the the Congress is trying to stop it, but so far that's not going anywhere. But yeah, I think the Congress, you know, it would be much better to go over Trump over Saudi Arabia and the Gulf and so forth, than go after him over Russia. I think there are many more things to be dug up there. You know, it's uh, um, the uh, it, it's a, it's a much more sort of culpable policy. Um, but, uh, you know, we'll see what happens. Yeah. Well, and, you know, I think this is important, too, that which it just goes to show the absurdity of the situation, unfortunately. But, you know, if they're, they're really talking about impeaching him for obstruction of justice on a high treason charge that it turns out he got a no bill on, <laughs> he hadn't done anything, uh, the whole investigation came to nothing. Um, what a hoax. But if they really think he's that dangerous, they really want to get rid of him. The thing to do would be to charge him with war crimes in Yemen, which are absolutely well, indefensible. Yemen, what is the connection? What do they know about Khashoggi? When did they know it? You know, these are real events. You yeah, know, you know, somebody is you know is is murdered and dismembered. You know, there's uh, a war has started in Yemen. You know, there, um, you know, a, a military uh, um, regime. You know, very brutal military regime is supported in Egypt. So, you know, the protesters are massacred in Sudan. These are real things they could go after. You know, it was always incredibly hazy, and, you know, what was the real allegation, and what were they supposed to have done, and so forth. Right. Uh, you know, you know, from the beginning, I may say, I always thought that, was, you know, crackers. Yeah, of course. Um, but the thing is, too, is it would be a great opportunity if they were really serious about removing this guy from power. They would have to go after the Democrats, too. And that would prove, really, yeah. that they meant it, that it wasn't just some kind of partisan <laughs> witch, huh? Yeah. You know, a lot of Trump's policy in the Middle East is not much different from, you know, the, the one that Obama was pursuing before, and Hillary Clinton said that she would uh, pursue if she had won the election. Yeah. 
After all, it was uh, not Donald Trump who was president in 2015. And it seems like, in fact, now it was two years of Obama and two years of Trump. That's the perfect thing to charge them both for. And then, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll hold our breath. All right, well, listen, I really appreciate your time on the show. I'm at 5,000 interviews today, Patrick, and probably a hundred and something of those oh, are of you. It's been terrific. And, and I'm really appreciative of all the time that you've shared uh, coming on the show to share your expertise here, so I uh, really do appreciate oh, no, it. Thanks. thanks for all your intelligent questions over that period. All right, well, uh, you have a good one. Appreciate it again. Thank you. Bye-bye. All right, you guys, that's Patrick Coburn, Middle East correspondent at The Independent. And, of course, wrote uh, Chaos and Caliphate and uh, The Age of Jihad and Muqtada al-Sadr and a bunch of other books before that, too. All right, y'all. Thanks. Find me at libertarianinstitute.org, at scotthorton.org, antiwar.com, and reddit.com slash scotthortonshow. Oh, yeah, and read my book, Fool's Errand, Timed and the War in Afghanistan, at foolserand.us.